as we've already begun to talk about, the Psalms are, well, I would set them alongside the Book of Lamentations and some of the prophetic texts as the most emotive parts of the Bible. Uh, and that, I think, that intense emotion that informs the Psalms is certainly one of the things that makes them amongst the most important religious texts we have. I think of the statement by Theodore Retke, a 20th century lyric poet, on the ethical significance of poetry. He says that, he, comparing them to other art forms, he says the novel can teach us how to act but poetry and music teach us how to feel, and the feeling is vastly more important. Once we feel deeply, we begin to behave. It seems to me that the ethical significance of poetry is something that we may not consider enough, and, and I think it's really crucial if you're going to think about preaching the Psalms and perhaps other uh, poetic texts in the Bible. So I want to focus in this meditation lecture on how the Psalms may instruct our emotions and thus, as Retke says, teach us to behave. Um, I'm going to be focusing on two emotions in this. I think I'm going to use emotions, I'm going to put it in scare quotes, um, in a somewhat qualified sense as we go along, and perhaps we can talk about that later on. But two emotions I want to work with. One is longing for God, and the second one is fearing God. Uh, to us, those would seem to be opposites. Normally, we wish to avoid what we fear, uh, the psalmist does not feel that way. Both the psalmist's intense longing and the psalmist's fear are focused on God. So I want to look at that dynamic. I'm going to begin with longing for two reasons. Uh, first, because we are coming up on Lent, and it seems to me that that longing is a disposition that is especially apt to the Lenten season. Um, and second, because longing is the emotional tone that dominates the psalms of lament and therefore is one of the dominant emotional tones of the Psalter altogether. Um, I'm about to make a comparison which is not very well informed because I don't know much about Buddhism, but my sense is that the psalmists are not Buddhists. Um, they, far from practicing detachment, they practice holy desire. Um, and that tone, that tone of desire is so intense in the Psalter that medieval monastics, who of course their days were soaked in the Psalms, the medieval monastics read the Old Testament all together as the book of longing. The book of longing for the whole Old Testament. Uh, but they took their clue uh, from lines like these in the Psalter, as a deer uh, longs for um, the for water channels, so my soul, my soul, my being, uh, longs for you. I'll return to that word later on that I'm rendering. My soul, my being, but one could easily translate that. I'm sure Walt, uh, Robert Alter does translate it. So I long for you. Um, I'll talk more about that word later on. Doesn't mean the soul detached from my body. It's a crucial thing. As a deer longs for yearns toward water channels, so I long for you, O God. I 
thirst for God, uh, for the living God. Psalm 42, again, Psalm 63. Oh God, I, to you I look eagerly, I thirst for you, my flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land, waterless. The Old Testament as the book of longing, I really love that concept. It seems to me <coughs> infinitely preferable to seeing the Old Testament as the book of the angry God. Um, which somebody in my prayer, prayer group mentioned just a week ago. Um, I think the monastics got it exactly right. The Old Testament is a book of longing because it reflects so very much of our experience in this world. When we are living with a hope or living in a hope that is still not satisfied. Sometimes we are disappointed in ways that, and I'm not identifying the focus of disappointment because it can be any number of things. Sometimes the disappointment of our hope seems distinctly cruel. Um, and yet still we turn to God in expectation. Uh, it's accurate to say that longing for what God has yet to do in our lives, in our world, longing for what God has yet to do is the basic disposition of faith. Hope that is seen is no hope at all, as Paul says. These particular lines from the Psalter with that strong metaphor of thirst, uh, they underlie, of course, Jesus' own thirsting on the cross. Um, John 19, and surely John intends us to take that as more than a physiological response to the stress of crucifixion and the noonday heat in spring in Jerusalem. Jesus' thirsting is the most profound desiring imaginable. Jesus' thirst on the cross is at least in part, eschatological thirst. In um, Annette, in her introduction to me, spoke of time I have spent at Fairacre's convent in Oxford, and in the, ref in the refectory, in the convent, there's a crucifix, the only thing hanging on the wall is a crucifix, and underneath it is one Latin word, tzitzio, I thirst. Um, that's an important that's an important image in my own mind and so when we were designing a new chapel for Duke Divinity School um, I was able to get them to agree to put Sizio on our communion table uh, altar um, and so on one side of the altar the altar is this side and that side are both the same. And so most of the time, we have the side that reads uh, Alleluia on it. And then during Lent, so in a week, we'll turn it around and the side that reads Sitio, I thirst, will be, um, will be visible. Um, The implication of taking I thirst as a kind of motto for a worshiping community at a convent or at Duke Divinity School um, is that those who follow Christ are impelled by thirst 
And we also need to get used to being thirsty rather than being satisfied. Uh, Jesus' other words from the cross that are taken from the Psalms imply that he is the ideal prayer of the Psalms uh, because he is... um, because he articulates that experience of not being satisfied, far from satisfied, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yet, Jesus, one might say, has gotten used to being unsatisfied in this world, and so into that, your hand I commend my spirit, Psalm 31. One could say that Jesus learns the way of the cross from the psalmist. So longing is foundational for the psalms, but you could very easily miss that in translation. Um, Again, this theme that we're going to be returning to again and again. So I I want to... uh, give you a few lines from Psalm 40. You have my whole translation of it uh, on page 3. I chose Psalm 40 partly because I love Psalm 40, um, but also because a portion of Psalm 40 is normally appointed, I think, for the Feast of the Annunciation, which will be coming up in just a little over a month, the 25th of March. Um, So it's a psalm that uh, you may have an opportunity to preach on. So focusing on this idea and expression of longing, this is my translation, I waited in tense expectation, that's one Hebrew word, Um, uh, I waited in tense expectation for the Lord, the American Book of Common Prayer renders that I waited patiently for the Lord. Uh, And then the verse goes on. He turned to me and heeded my cry and brought me out from the raging pit from sucking mud. Again, that's my translation. Um, I waited intense expectation for the Lord. I waited patiently upon the Lord. Which of those translations is more emotionally persuasive to you? Um, It's, I mean, if you only had, I put a gap in here, uh, because if you only had the two, you might say, okay, I waited patiently upon the Lord. Some of us You know, some few saints manage to achieve that. (laughs) But then you get then you get to the rest of the verse. He brought me out from the raging pit from sucking mud really patiently. Um, The Hebrew verb that I'm translated there that I'm translated that I am translating, I waited in tense expectation. It's the Hebrew phrase is kavokiviti. Um, and the underlying noun is kav, and kav is a straight line in Hebrew. Um, it's with a verb in the Bible, the verb is much more common than the noun, but it's a straight line, um, and it, it stretched then, you might say, a line stretched taut between two points. Similarly, you might say that this prayer is a tightrope stretched between heaven and earth, or more properly, earth and heaven. A few lines further down. Um, Privileged is the, and again, this is, my rendering of that word, privileged is the 
Gever, the citizen, who makes the Lord his source of security and does not turn to monster gods and false idols. Uh, my translation, privileged is the citizen uh, who makes the Lord his source of security. The American Book of Common Prayer has happy are they who trust in the Lord. Um, Ashre does not mean happy in the 21st century sense of that word. It does mean happy in the 17th century um, meaning of that word, uh, which is a, you know, in 17th century English, happy is an objective statement about a condition. Um, a that one is in a good condition viewed objectively. Um, to us, happy is a subjective statement, meaning optimistic, cheerful, content, whatever. Um, but I translate it privileged, even though I realize that privileged has its own problems, but I'm here to explain it to you, so that's why I choose to do it. If I were publishing it, I'm not sure what I'd do. I'd probably do fortunate. Um, but I like privileged um, because this is a statement. It's used over and over again in the Bible, and it's the Hebrew word that gets translated into Greek as makarias, makarioi, uh, in the Beatitudes, for instance, blessed, it, but it, there's another Hebrew word for blessed, and this isn't it, so, um, so I'm not using it. But it's an objective statement about what constitutes the good life from a God's eye point of view. Ashrei describes the person who is leading a spiritually productive life based on a real relationship with God, who makes the Lord his source of security. As I mentioned, the psalm is appointed for the Feast of the Annunciation. Um, so I find it intriguing to hear the speaking voice here as being Mary, the mother of Jesus. And in that narrative context, I like to think of Mary as being a gever, a citizen, uh, who makes the, so the Lord her source of security. Gever, uh, in Hebrew, refers to, in biblical Hebrew, refers to someone who is established in a community. Uh, gever probably is a semi-technical term for a landowner. Um, so someone whose commitments and well-being are wholly identified with the interests of the community, someone who in ancient, the ancient Israelite village, uh, which was an agrarian village, um, ha a landowner, a farmer, someone with a permanent commitment to the well-being of that place and the people in it, and therefore someone who is privileged to exercise judgment at the gate, which is how judgment was rendered in, the, um, in small Israelite communities. Um, so thinking of Mary as a gever, a citizen in that sense, could we say that Mary is a full citizen in the commonwealth where God is sovereign? Let it be done to me according to your word. Um, that kind of true security um, is not a state of ease. And I think, again, putting this in uh, the narrative of Mary, mother of Jesus, a pregnant unmarried teenager, uh, you can sense the tension here, waiting in tense expectation for God's action to become fully visible. Um, 
The psalmist was saved by God. We hear that in the narration of the psalm. But the psalmist is quite evidently still beset by enemies and needs further acts of deliverance. Um, I'm just going to read you a, a few lines. He turned to me and heeded my outcry, brought me out from the, suck the raging pit, the sucking mud, set my feet on a rock, made my footsteps firm. God has done all of these things, put in my mouth a new song. Um, and yet, uh, the psalmist goes on, verse 13, to say, for evils without number have encompassed me, my own iniquities have caught up with me, I cannot see, they are more in number than the hairs of my head, my heart forsakes me. Show favor, O Lord, and deliver me, O Lord, haste, hurry to my aid. And then speaking of the enemies, let them be ashamed and altogether disgraced. So this is very much a, um, the psalmist is very much in medias race, in the middle of the thing, the thing being deliverance, uh, full deliverance from enemies. Um, and the great contrast in this psalm, as we see here, is between those who perceive the reality of God and therefore make the uh, God, their source of security, again, the theocentricity of the Psalms, as we talked about, uh, the contrast between those, uh, that perception of reality and the delusion of those who worship monster gods, taninim, sea monsters, figures of chaos in the Bible. Um, I'll give you a rendering of Psalm 40 by contemporary poet Lawrence Weeder. He's at Yale Divinity School. Uh, in his lovely little book, I think it's still in print, called Words to God's Music, they're not translations of the Psalms, but they are modern poems written in response to each of the 150 Psalms, and he's trying to capture something of the feeling content and something of the theological substance of each of the psalms. But again, they're very, con they're very contemporary and the context is his life, not, um, uh, he's not recreating the life of biblical characters, David or anyone else. So this is just, this is his response to Psalm 40. And um, it starts with these lines, which I like very much. For years I wanted more than sky to hear me mutter, more than meditations on the dark behind a wall. It's a poem about longing, and Weeder is evoking his young self, when he was a commercial writer working, I think, in New York City. Um, people were paying him, essay, paying him good money. He was a successful young commercial writer uh, working in the world of art. Um, but he says that, it's a fairly long poem, I'm not giving it all to you, but he says that he wanted better stories no one asks for. Uh, instead, what they're asking him to do is writing, uh, write critical essays about expensive paintings. Um, and he says that work, it's well paying, but he just describes it with these lines, substantial but unmusical, a seashell out of ocean. I like Weeder's poem because it helps me to um, think about my own young self. Uh, and I felt very much what he describes as uh, wanting more than sky to hear me mutter, more than meditations on the dark behind the wall. Um, and it was 
that longing for some kind of personal connection with God and a a depth of relationship with God. I mean, I went to church every week at least, but what I missed was a sense of um, of real connection. And it was that that took me to seminary. I was also, I was working for a religious nonprofit, uh, the Protestant Radio and Television Center in Atlanta. I was, um, and I was, as I say, I was going to church every week. And this actually, this refers to what Annette Brownlee mentioned earlier. I would listen to, to the preaching and think, there's got to be more than they're letting on. Um, and so I decided that the only way I was going to find that out was to go to seminary. Um, I, I did not go for professional purposes. I had no intention of being ordained, and I'm not, as you know, uh, nor did I have any intention of being a professor. I, would, I assumed that I would go back to working in the religious nonprofit world, which I actually liked, but I wanted to be able to do it with a greater depth of perception. Um, and I like his line. I wanted a better story, as he puts it. Uh, no one was asking for He was writing commercial copy. I was writing grant proposals okay, um, for a religious nonprofit, but I wasn't doing theology. Uh, and I wanted to learn how to pray. I wanted to do more than, um, than mutter to sky or something on the other side of a dark wall, and I didn't know how to, how to start doing that. Um, having stumbled into the life of a biblical scholar, um, as you heard Annette Brownlee talk about, I now have the privilege of dwelling on a really good story. I suspect it's the best story ever. Um, and so do you have that same privilege. We are in the words of Psalm 40, we are in the condition of being ashre. We are privileged. Um, and, and this may be the most important thing I have learned out of teaching that story and reflecting upon what it means for preaching. Uh, and that is a really good story is a story about God and us. And it begins and ends with God. As preachers, teachers, writers, storytellers. Does everyone in this room uh, fit somewhere into that list of vocations? Teachers, preachers, writers, storytellers. We need to be sure that the stories we tell meet those criteria. It's about God and us, and it begins and ends ends with God. Let's look at another psalm of longing, Psalm 130. I don't remember. I did give it to you on a slide. Okay, it's also, it's also in the handout. I'll just read the whole thing since it's short. Out of deep places I cry to you, O Lord, O oh Lord, hear me out. Let your ears be attuned to the voice of my pleading. If you were to keep track of wrongdoing, O oh Lord, my Lord, who could stand? Yet with you is forgiveness, so you may be feared. I wait in tension, Lord, my whole self, Hebrew word is nefesh, waits Tensely. I'm rejecting the Book of Common Prayer's translation, My Soul Waits for the Lord. I wait in tension, Lord. My whole self waits tensely. And to his word I look expectantly. 
my whole self, my nephesh, for the Lord, more than watchman for the morning, watchman for the morning. O Israel, wait expectantly for the Lord, for with the Lord is covenant loyalty, chesed, and with him redemption abounds, and it is he who will redeem Israel from all its wrongdoing. What strikes me first about this is how active the psalmist is in getting God's attention. Look, he is in a deep pit of misery. There's no indication that God at this moment is shining any light into that pit. It would be easy enough to lapse into self-absorbed whining. But in fact, our psalmist's response is exactly the opposite. Instead of turning inward, she turns outward. With the most intent focus and desire, wanting one thing only, to catch sight of God. More than watchman for the morning, watchman for the morning. It's the depth of the soul's dark night. God is unaccountably missing in action at the time when things are as bad as they can get. Out of deep places I cry to you. Yet, consider the strangeness of this. It never occurs to the psalmist that the terrifying absence of God is reason to give up on God and rely wholly on himself. That possibility does not seem to cross the psalmist's radar screen. God's absence only makes the psalmist more determined, more alert as she watches and waits for God to show up. I wait in tension, Lord, my whole self, waits tensely, my whole self, for the Lord, more than watchman for the morning, watchman for the morning. Martin Luther, in his favorite hymn, um, famous hymn based on this psalm, uh, calls this attitude, waiting on God. Um, I thought that was Simone Weil, and of course it is, but I think she gets it from Luther. The English rendering of that hymn, uh, which is in the American hymnal, probably um, in the Canadian hymnal as well, um, the English rendering of the hymn ends with the line, his help I wait with patience. His help I wait with patience. Waiting on God, the Christian virtue of patience, these are very important concepts uh, for theologians such as Simone Weil or Stanley Hauerwas, my colleague. Um, As I understand it, Christians more or less invented patience as a virtue. Obviously, it's a Latin word, But the Latin word means to suffer, to endure something. It's not a virtue, as Romans and Greeks thought about it. Um, But Christians did come to see it that way. Um, And it seems to me, again, on the cusp of Lent, that cultivating that virtue of patience is something that we might do with the season that lies ahead. I think it would be an excellent discipline for us as long as we understand that the kind of patience that is a Christian virtue has nothing to do with complacency. The patience that is a Christian virtue has nothing to do with passivity. On the contrary, the state of waiting on God, and I don't know a better expression of it than this psalm, waiting on God is a condition of total alertness and at the same time of total receptivity. 
that same um, word that I was talking about with Psalm 40, um, qui ve, to wait like, you know, to wait stretched, between, taut between two points. That's one of the Hebrew verbs that's present here. Um, since I'm on translation, I'm also going to look at the noun um, in that phrase. Nafshi, my nefesh, uh, waits tensely for the Lord. Uh, the problem with the standard translation, uh, my soul waits for the Lord, is that nefesh does not mean soul as we normally think of it. As I noted, Israelites did not conceive of soul as a disembodied entity, and nothing could make it clearer than the fact that the word that is normally translated uh, with, into English renderings of the Psalter as soul, the Hebrew word nefesh denotes this part of my body. This is my nefesh, okay? Uh, it is the part of my body through which I ingest food and drink, and breathe. That's your nefesh. Okay. So, um, it, while it is one of two Hebrew words for throat, it's fairly rare that it appears in the Bible in that literal sense. It occurs dozens of times in the Bible, maybe hundreds of times in the Bible. Almost always in the sense of denoting my whole living self. Okay? Uh, that's why when we were talking about, I think it was Psalm 40, I rendered it in several places just I, just the pronoun I, because it denotes um, every part of me, my mind, my heart, my soul, my guts. All of that is what is in waiting tensely for the Lord. Um, in other words, every part that is engaged when we are waiting for a call, say, on which everything depends from the doctor, um, from the child in a, in a dangerous situation, the spouse in a dangerous situation, it is the most, this denotes the most passionate form of patience, body, and soul. Cultivating that kind of passionate patience directed at God may bring us closer to Jesus as he walks the way of the cross. This psalm could be the words of Jesus as he makes his way to Jerusalem to die. Out of deep places I cry to you, Lord, hear me out. I wait in tension, Lord, my whole self waits tensely, and to his word I look expectantly. Jesus might have prayed the psalm out of the profound depths of Gethsemane, when his whole body is math, his whole being, as Matthew tells us, was deeply grieved, when, as Luke tells us, his sweat was falling like blood. And yet, with the psalmist, he looked to Jesus with passionate patience, trusting to God's mercy and forgiveness looking for the redemption of God's people. I think we might find a portrait of that kind of passionate uh, patience exercised on the cross. In, on the left, I am giving you John of the Cross's image of Jesus from his prayer book, 16th century. Um, and then 20th century Salvador Dali's meditation on John of the Cross's meditation on Jesus on the cross. 
But in both of them, I choose them for today in relation to this theme of passionate patience. Um, because what I see in both of them is a body that is bound to the cross and at the same time straining away from it. Especially in John's image, it seems to me his, um, he's poised almost like a bird for flight with his legs um, bent almost as though pushing off. Uh, and, and then in Dolly's image, um, we see Jesus straining forward toward God and at the same time hovering over the world in a moment of new creation. When I speak of him hovering over the world, and I imagine this was in Dolly's mind, I'm thinking of um, the first, what, the first couple of verses of the Bible. Um, um, and the earth was waste schmaced. Um, and the spirit of God, hovering, it's a bird word, uh, over the face of the earth. And I think you can see something of that here. Um, let's go back to a line I skipped over. If you were to keep track of wrongdoing, O Lord, it's verse 3, my Lord, who could stand? Yet with you is forgiveness, so you may be feared. For years, I had no idea what to do with that line. It made no sense to me. Why should we... Fear God, who is the source of forgiveness. The answer, I think, is not obvious. I don't think I'm unusually dense on this point. Um, and, I, and it's not an answer that comes to anyone without some pain. Maybe that's why this psalm is given to us. It discloses to us a secret that is revealed only to those who cry out of deep places. So I want to end this meditation uh, by exploring that question. What is the relationship between knowing that forgiveness is from God or is with God and that, being, that knowledge somehow being an enabling condition for fearing God. As you know, fearing God is a good thing in the Bible. It denotes a healthy state of mind and heart. Yerchat Adonai, Yerchat Elohim, this is the ordinary biblical phrase for what we might call true faith, okay? or true religion. There is no biblical Hebrew word for religion, but that phrase, fear of God, yirchat Elohim, would be as close as you can come. Um, it's fallen very much out of favor in uh, recent years, at least amongst English speakers, uh, translators very often render it revere, stand in awe. I think those are sort of popular options for rendering both the verb and the noun. But I want to argue that the time has come for a robust theology of fearing God. Uh, and that, indeed, it's one of the most critical theological tasks we might perform in our time. Uh, for this reason, fearing God as it is represented, remember, no, that's, uh, fearing God as it is represented throughout the Bible is the exact opposite of human arrogance. You can fear God properly only if you know the reality of God 
and you can feel God only if you know you are not God. It takes honesty, courage, humility to fear God. The honesty and the humility to admit that you are not really in charge of your own life. The courage to risk entrusting yourself and the future wholly to God. It follows then that the inability to fear God or the refusal to fear God or the avoidance of fearing God, so we translate it revere, stand in awe. This is a severe, in, as the Bible sees it, this is a severe spiritual and emotional incapacity. It manifests itself in recklessness. And the biblical archetype of recklessness in the Bible is fallow. Pharaoh says, when Moses comes to him and says, the Lord says, let my people go, he says, who is this Lord? I don't know any Lord, and I'm not going to let your people go. Um, he does, I don't know any Lord. It, it's a wonderful phrase in Gregory of Nyssa's Life of Moses. And he describes Pharaoh as not liking to have God in his knowledge. How great is that? He doesn't like to have God. Gregory of Nyssa. It's, it's, uh, he doesn't, sorry, I didn't think of it before this. I didn't make a slide. He doesn't like to have God in his knowledge. He's incapable, therefore, of fearing God. And as a result, Pharaoh destroys himself the army of Egypt, and the land of Egypt. It seems to me that Pharaoh's story has emblematic significance as we reckon with climate crisis and how we need to change our hearts, our feelings, and as Retke teaches us, therefore, as a result of changing our feelings, how we are enabled to change our behavior. You may remember that Pharaoh's courtiers say to him, it's about chapter 10 of Exodus, I think it's somewhere between the seventh and the eighth plague, so the sixth or the seventh, it's pretty far along. And the courtiers say to Pharaoh, do you not yet know that Egypt the land of Egypt is history. Do you not yet know that the land of Egypt has disappeared, it's vanished? It's that word we were talking about in Psalm 1, Yoved. Um, it seems to me that this area of climate crisis is perhaps the key area in which the church has something special to say to the community of nations something to say in distinctly theological language as we wake up to the recognition that we have acted like God, but we are not God. And the climate crisis is the evidence of our massive wrongdoing in the language of the psalm, the final word of the psalm. Pray God it is possible that we will repent with holy fear and look to God for forgiveness. And here again, we see how the psalm might be heard as the words of Jesus, but this time not Jesus' prayer for himself, but Jesus' prayer for the people. So in the language of the psalm, it is he who will redeem Israel from all its wrongdoing. Let's now listen to this psalm 
in conjunction with the Lord's Prayer uh, and see how it may amplify and deepen Jesus' instruction, to which we were just referring at the end of the last session, um, on the prayer that God may forgive us as we forgive those who sin against us. Our Father, forgive us as our sins as we practice holy patience. Our Father, forgive us our sins as we orient our whole selves to you, body and soul. You might also render that in light of what I've just been talking about with climate change, as we render our whole material existence to you, as we orient our whole material existence toward you. Our Father, forgive us our sins as we learn to trust wholly in your mercy. Our Father, forgive us our sins as we learn to fear you in love. Um, and I take the, love is not a word that appears in the psalm, uh, but I take the liberty of bringing those together. I'm thinking of a wonderful sermon uh, that John Donne preaches. I think it's in one of my books. It, and I'm not sure which one. It may be in imagination shaped. I kind of think it is. Um, and John Donne has a wonderful passage on the love of God, which is also an excerpt from that, is in uh, the book that, Peter, you were showing us, the one I just published, uh, Opening Israel Scriptures, in which he speaks, he's, um, his text, it's a psalm text, Listen, my children, and you shall hear, and I shall teach you the fear of the Lord. Um, and uh, as he does that meditation on the fear of the Lord, he says that the fear of God runs into the love of God, that they are really a single disposition just viewed in two different facets from two different angles. Um, so it was thinking of that that gave me that last phrase, forgive us our sins as we learn to fear you in love.